Hello everyone, welcome back to the Fascinating Woman Hit channel. On our channel, we talk about everything that has to do with developing femininity and building strong, long-lasting, loving relationships. I am Sherry Lynn, and I'm so excited to be here with both of my parents, Dixie Andalyn Forsyth and Dr. Robert Forsyth. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so today we are talking about why men commit mass shootings. There's probably a ton in the news about this topic of mass shootings, but there's not a ton of people discussing why men are doing it. Why are, why are young men doing this and not women? A lot of the research you will find on the internet talks a lot about the instability of homes, homes that are dysfunctional and lots of different theories about why young men are doing this. Now, when we're talking about a mass shooting, keep in mind, we are talking about a shooting where at least four people were killed. This doesn't even include shootings where two people were killed and or one person was killed. This is bit larger numbers that we're talking about today. And we really want to dig deep into the topic of why young men are doing this. Why aren't women doing this? This is one of the reasons why we have dad on here because he's a doctor. Dad, do you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about your experience as a doctor? We have a lot of new viewers that have just recently subscribed to our channel and they probably haven't seen you talk about your expertise. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Well, I'm a neuropsychologist. I have been practicing for 40 years. I've done a lot of different things, taught university. I've been director of a substance abuse program for a number of years. I've done all kinds of hospital work, private practice. I've seen uh, thousands of people in various situations. I've even talked to kids, young people, men who have committed crimes. And uh, I worked in prisons briefly uh, when I was younger. That's, that's something I did probably for maybe a year or two. So it wasn't a lot of experience, but I've had exposure to just a lot of different people. And I, I, I could just say that I was born in the 40s and grew up in the 50s. I remember the 50s pretty well and what it was like for kids. Yeah. So is, is it fair to say that you, um, you have a bit of a specialty with younger, with the younger uh, generation? You know, I've always uh, appreciated working with younger kids because I've thought that if I could have an impact at a younger age, that's much more powerful than working with them when they're 40 or 50 or whatever. So I, I actually do you know, work with young children, Head Start, children's services in the hospital. So I, I actually like working with younger kids. Uh, I hope to make a difference with them. And I think sometimes I've been able to do that. I think it's so great that we have you on here today to talk about this because we actually have the expert here to explain some of these things. And as I mentioned earlier, we are going to talk a little bit about kind of talk about what's going on in young men's minds. And we're going to talk about our, what we think is going on, what dad thinks is going on, what mom thinks is going on and the impact that it has. So before we go into all that, we want to talk about, you touched on this a second ago, we want to talk about what it used to be like, because as many of you probably know, mass shootings are something that has really been on the rise more recently in the last 20 years or so. Why weren't they common in the 50s? So we're going to talk a little bit about the history of kind of where men were back then. We're just picking the 50s to just pick it as an example. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what we think is going on now. And then we're going to have at the end, just a little bit of advice, what we think anyone out there might want to know more about the subject. Perhaps they have sons and they want to uh, have more impact on their sons. We're going to talk a little bit about that at the end. So just what was it like in the 50s for young men? What, how was their life different then than it is now? You know, I've noticed a huge difference. Like when I was a kid, we didn't have video games. I mean, I barely saw a TV station and there was like one or two of them when I was probably eight or 10 years old. And it was a huge uh, TV with a little tiny screen. And I used to watch the Mickey Mouse Club and cartoons. And But there, there wasn't much on. And it seemed like it shut down. And I was, I was outside most of the time. I was playing, especially... You know, the weather, if it was good weather, I was playing ball. I was uh, interacting with other kids my age. The us boys were out playing cowboys or we were riding bikes or we were doing a lot of active things. And I see so much difference today. I see so many kids essentially in a room with a computer and that's about it. And I, so I see a huge difference in just the activity level and also the freedom. Like I would get on my bike and ride all over the place. Uh, I don't think, you know, I don't, my parents didn't always know where I was. I might be up in the, up in the nearby uh, foothills or kind of small mountains <laughs> looking for pine nuts or we're, we're doing all kinds of, you know, maybe building a fort somewhere or I was doing all kinds of active things. And it seems to me that kids today are a lot less free to do those things. Well, it was also safe to hitchhike. And as a teenager, he'd sometimes hitchhike home to, from school. You can't do that now. 
Well, occasionally after basketball practice or something, somebody was, you know, it just wasn't convenient for somebody to get me. So I just go out and hitchhike. And a lot of times I was picked up because it was local. I, people knew me. And so, you know, maybe a, a, a farmer that near, lived nearby, we lived in a rural community, they would say, oh, yeah, g- give me a ride. And I, I don't know, it was a kind of a different world. Well, and there's some, there's some positives to the changes. I mean, I think in, in some ways you could say that kids are safer now and there's not as many, we could go into a whole, whole thing right. with that. But I think right. it's important what you're pointing out here is that you had a ton more physical exercise. You were not only exercising your body, you're exercising your mind, you were problem solving. You mentioned coming home, you probably learned a lot about directions as a young boy, because you were walking around, going around freely. And right. it sounds like you're saying, you know, the video games and the technology right now is preventing some of those things from happening with our younger kids. Learning, learning about social, interacting with other boys and making friends. If you're on your device and you're doing things, you're not, you maybe have some of these games, have somebody in another place, even another part of the world playing with you, but you don't see them. There's no physical interaction in the sense of you're in the same room. Right. Okay. It's good to exercise your mind. That, that's a good thing for brain development, but physical exercise is really good for the brain too. We think it's good right. for the body, the muscles, the, you know, your- well, Particularly, your, well, this is focusing on boys. Yeah, boys. Boys need this activity because boys have, you know, a lot of testosterone. There's a lot of energy there. And I, I grew up being taught that masculine energy was a good thing. Well, you spoke a lot about technology. What? Let's move into schools because you just kind of mentioned like, you were taught about masculinity being like something positive. What was school like, do you think, not just for you, but for teen, for younger boys in the 50s, 60s? I think that for me, there was a lot of activity. I was into sports. Uh, there was a lot of things we could do. We, we went to dances and we interacted with other kids. And I think you learn a lot interacting with others. But being isolated, you don't get as much feedback and how to relate to others. And you don't get socialized as well. We also talked about when we were going to school, discipline was usually handled by the teacher and the teacher and the teacher didn't always, didn't hardly ever, unless it was bad, report home to parents. They just, they made you sit in the corner if you misbehaved or you had a teacher. Well, I had a teacher that, and I sometimes was busy. (laughs) I was doing things I probably shouldn't be doing. I was distracted. And, uh, you know, I did well in school, basically, but I had one teacher, I remember that she always had a piece of chalk in her hand. And if I ever got out of line or well, for that matter, anybody else, she would come and drill that in my head. I mean, I don't mean literally, but she kind of, she put a white mark on the top of my head and it kind of redirected me Plus for the moment, but she didn't, she didn't send me to the principal. Typically, she just took care of it herself and we right. went on. And now there, p- kids get written up for, I don't know. I don't know. It seems, seems to me that there's a lot of sending to the principal and write-ups. And I, I don't know. I imagine the principals get like overwhelmed sometimes. What about you mentioned something when we were talking about this earlier, you mentioned something about how boys, not only, you know, them being masculinity was a positive thing. Can you talk about what that may have looked like in every day? Well, you know, I think there was a definite difference back then. You know, boys were boys and girls were girls. And there wasn't a big question about that. Yeah, but boys wore pants, jeans, mm-hmm. girls wore dresses. And I wore more dresses right. to wear pants. That's right. They, when the boys went to school, they looked kind of dressed up. They didn't look uh, shabby. And they took of, care of themselves a little bit more. Perhaps we wore, we wore jeans and maybe t-shirts or a regular shirt, but I'm just saying that like today I'll see kids with ripped, ripped clothes that are actually more expensive than the, what yeah. I call it. <laughs> then if anybody came in with something like that, they would try to hide it with their hand. They put their hand put over a patch on a it. hole or if there's a patch on their clothes, they felt that was kind of considered, you know, not, not a, socially acceptable. So there, it was a different, people tried to look a little bit, I don't know, I think a little bit, not sure. <laughs> Yeah. You know, now it seems to be cool to kind of look rough and, and ripped and tattered and, and your hair is a little bit carefully disheveled. And I don't know, there's there's some different different ways it's of almost like presenting. It's, it, it's almost as if it's somewhat popular to look like you don't take care of yourself right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you don't care. Who or you don't care. I don't yeah, know. maybe that's better to say. Right. On a playground, you know, there was a lot of competition going on. I remember going to a new school and one of the, I guess maybe one of the... Um, more assertive boys there saw me as a new person and I was fairly tall for my age young and he decided that uh, he was going to check me out and so we ended up wrestling I mean fighting we got into a big fight and argument and battle and competition oh yeah we were kind of getting at it and uh, we we had this you know everybody's watching we have this fight 
And uh, then, you know, it was over. And the interesting thing is he actually became a good friend of mine. But guys are kind of competitive. And we saw, I think mas masculine energy was not seen as such a bad thing. Nobody broke us up. They just kind of, okay, those guys are just kind of trying to figure it out. Working out our relationship. And who's, the, who's the top dog and who isn't? And we ended up being great friends. So think, it was a different time. What do you think bullying was like back then? Because there's always been bullies. There right? was, yeah. There were bullies. Yeah, some of the older kids would bully some of me when I was in junior high. I remember some of the senior high students, they would give us what they, what they called a swirly. They'd take you into the bathroom, turn you upside down, and hold your head in the toilet and then flush it. And it was humiliating. I mean, it, did they put your face under the water? No, it was more your top of your head. They, they were just going to give you a swirly and you're all wet. And it was embarrassing and, and that sort of thing. So there were bullies like that. But I think the, there's more now. Were well, there yeah, bullies? Yeah, but girl, girl bullies did things like they said bad things about you behind your back. No. You were more verbal okay. about it. Verbal. The boys were more physical about it. The ah. bullies were more physical. This is really difficult to hear. Uh, I'm sure people probably already are somewhat aware of this, but in the 50s, there was one. And in the 60s, there were six. What do you guys think about that? I think there's been a difference in our culture. I think there's, right. you know, there's differences. You know, I think there's more, uh, I think kids are more isolated. I think it's so much easier for a young guy to, you know, not really connect to other people. And well, why we, between one sixties and fifties? Why is it six times? Well, yeah, there were six in the sixties. Well, it, it was an increase to the sixties. Okay. I remember the sixties as well. And it was a, a time of kind of rebellion. There was a certain amount of rebellion against society and young people were trying to do things to assert their independence. And, uh, there was a, a lot more drug use in the 60s. Families started to s struggle where people were, maybe both parents were working. We saw, you know, we saw a change in the 50s. It seemed like there was more of a, a expectation that, you know, dad was working, mom was at home with the kids. It was a little different style of, of living. Well, in the 60s, I remember the, we started hearing the term latchkey kids, which is kids who come home and their both parents are gone and they have to have a key to get in there all alone. So oh. that started. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's yeah. interesting, too, that the divorce rate, not that not that I'm saying by any means that this is to be blamed on the divorce rate. But I just think it's interesting that the divorce rate climbed significantly from the 50s into the 60s and 70s, because I remember we did research on that a video a while ago. And I can put I can pop the number up on the screen, but like it was a significantly higher amount from the 50s to the 70s. One of the things we researched for boys, this is again about boys, because girls experience when their parents divorce, too. But girl, boys don't, are not as much in comfortable in touch with their feelings. Girls will tend to find friends to talk to, to kind of deal with it. Boys tend to keep things more to themselves. Right. And, and any kind of trauma that a young, particularly boy in this case, experiences can contribute to his acting out later. When you hold your feelings inside, it's easier to act them out for boys. Girls will often talk them out. And boys tend to act it out. So that can really make a difference. And boys have more testosterone and they're more aggressive. Boys just tend to be more aggressive. And I think with a lot of these, when you research these mass shootings, that you find that the boys don't tend to have many friends. They tend to be kind of loners, kind of isolated. Occasionally like-minded friends, but still often they're loners or they're disconnected some way. And they feel like maybe they don't perhaps fit in some somehow, or maybe they have felt rejected. So you mentioned something about how boys, you know, they, they bully physically. So do you think that they were still physical bullies back then as there are now? That's kind of the same. Yeah, sure. There are not as many. I, I, yeah, but there still were. There, there, were. Are, there are always, I think there's always bullies. Yeah. And sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes that's not just at school. It may be in your home. Sometimes right. a parent can be a bully and you right. say, well, it's the dad. Well, sometimes it's mom. Yeah. So it, Kids get bullied at home, and I think uh, some of these kids that have acted out in aggression like that have been bullied, and they don't like that. Well, sometimes they're teachers. Sometimes it's teachers. teachers. Right, right. Yeah. Sooner or later in your life, you're going to be meet someone who is mean. Yeah. Who's going to <laughs> you or betray you or somehow uh, make you want to get some revenge. <laughs> Whenever you feel like a victim, you want kind of justice or you want mm -hmm. to get this. And whatever the bullying situation you, I think, sometimes can get into that feeling of victim, and victim is a terrible place to be. So yeah. let's get some justice here. It's powerless. Being a victim, whenever you feel like a victim, you feel powerless. We did a lot of research on the last 20 years, different shooters, like very extensive research. And one of the things that we noticed is that 
the majority of them were bullied and there were a lot, there was a lot of information about them being bullied, but we also noticed that a lot of them, not all suffered from several mental health issues. What do you think in the past was going on with mental health and how did that impact there not being as many shootings? I think that kids were more active and when you're active, it seems to counteract, let's say depression. Right. You know, when you're, when you're maybe either bullied or let's say, you don't have a lot to do. It's easy to just sit and, I don't know, get bored. From there, it's easy to just say, you know, things are kind of either hopeless or, or what's the point? What, what, what can I do? And action, doing, doing things is good for people. And I think it counteracts some of the depression. We see more depression, I think, in, among young people. Yeah. Suicide, I think, is, I believe it's the second highest. leading high and highest cause of death for among teenagers. teenagers. Yeah. Okay, so now that we've talked a lot about the past, what do you think is going on with boys now? Because this is also difficult to hear. In 2021, there were 683 mass shootings. That is mm -hmm. so difficult. I know that I know you guys know this. Every time you turn on the news, it seems like you're afraid to see what's going to be on there because or read read it on your phone. Because I remember the very, very first shooting that I remember was Columbine. And mm -hmm. I was in high school at that time. And I remember just being so terrified of that happening to me. And now fast forward here now into 2022, it's kind of a thing you hear about. You don't get quite the chills that you, that at least I got the first time I heard about it because it's kind of becoming something you hear about often, which is scary. So what's going on with these boys? Because you don't hear about any girls going up and shooting up any schools. And why is it schools? A bully is going to pick on usually somebody that's either weaker in a, in a lesser strength position. Yeah, they open. usually don't go take on a bigger person. Occasionally that happens, but usually a bully picks on somebody that is easy, an easier target. An easier target. You're right. You know, I think that I mentioned earlier that I believe that masculine energy is something we need. And I think that we have in the past more recognized that, although still in movies today, sometimes I'll see a, we could say a villain or somebody that's evil. And then there's the, the good people that are going to try and take them down and get justice. And so this good and evil, you yeah. know, is a constant theme in movies. And, you know, that's a really constant theme. But I think that, you know, I think in a lot of ways today, men are somewhat marginalized. It, it's almost like masculinity has been attacked as bad. When I think masculinity is great, but we define, I, I, I know Dixie and I have talked about this a lot. What is, what is a masculine man? To me, it's somebody who is strong, maybe even dangerous, but it's under control. Mm -hmm. I love it when somebody we can manage strength. manage strength and somebody comes into a, a burning building and saves people or they take out the villain or whatever it is. Manage strength is great. We need it. It's not bad. Now, there's bad actors and some people that are ag aggressive and take that to the extremes, they often end up in prison. Sometimes they end up as, as mass murderers. I, I think sometimes they are trying to show or compensate for feeling like they have been uh, disenfranchised or they've been ignored. And they're going to say, okay, I'm not going to be a victim anymore. I'm going to become the aggressor and I will not be passed over. I'm going to, people are going to know me. And I, I believe that these Master. bad actors, we could say, I think that they, they are aware of others who do this and they get notoriety for it. And it's almost like, Hey, I can prove my competence. I can prove that I'm worth uh, something. Even if I, if, even if I'm going to be the, the best word, I'm going to be the best at being the worst person around. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. There's almost a copycat kind of a thing here sometimes. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's because of the internet? Right. Well, you know, I think the media, in a way, there's a, it's, it's, it's news. It's, it's the news cycle. We've got 24 hour news cycles and they need something new to, to show. And, you know, I'm not saying well, news is all bad. I'm just saying that they, they tend to highlight some of these things. Well, he brings up a good point because when we were growing up, the news was like at five o'clock for an hour. They did not have time to cover all the details of all the things around the world that are happening. Now at 24 seven online, they, they've got to find content. And so it's, it's constantly out there. But the, the other thing is that boys, there's a definite push in our culture and it seems to be spreading around the world to, for boys to not be as masculine and girls to not be as feminine. So there's some yeah. kind of a push or some kind of neutrality that doesn't really happen with people. And so girls feel more disenfranchised with their femininity and boys yeah. feel more disenfranchised with their masculinity. Right. I agree. You, you mentioned I something, you mentioned something earlier that really kind of connected with me when you said when I was in school and when most of the boys, when we had a problem, we kind of dealt with it and they let us deal with it. And 
uh, usually that might end up, that may have ended up in you having some kind of physical, you mentioned wrestling and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, of course we don't want to encourage boys to just beat each other up, but I think there's something really healthy about that kind of way of being able to deal with confrontation because right now I can just long story made short, I have a son in school and I can tell you right now, if he has a disagreement with a boy on the playground, guess what he's asked to do. <laughs> he's asked to step away, get a teacher and they have to talk. And basically the talking has to do with, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, blah, blah, blah. Otherwise you either are going to get a behavioral write-up. You probably might get both and, and, or you might go to the principal. And I think it's tough for boys to resolve things like that. Can you speak a little bit to like, that's, I think that's what I'm thinking of when you say boys are being told that they kind of need to be more feminine. To me, that's kind of a more, that's a, that's a, how I might encourage my daughter to handle something because she's probably that's a little bit met. better with words and explaining what's going on. Whereas he hasn't got to those words yet. He hasn't, he's young and he hasn't got to that place. Perhaps in high school, they can probably do those things. I'm not sure, but I think there's something being taught out there right now that boys are not allowed to resolve conflict in a healthy way. Does that make yeah, sense? I, I, I like to see them in sports because that's a, I personally see that as a very healthy way to compete right. and to <laughs> even to be aggressive and let some of that stuff out because boys really need a release for all that energy. As a neuropsychologist, I, I'm aware of the of brain development. The brain develops kind of downstairs up and it doesn't get fully networked up or uh, myelinated until you're probably 25 or 30 years old. Girls start networking much younger than boys and they're often able to talk about and you know talk out feelings and so on. But yeah. boys are often later. It's often even later teens, even in their 20s, where they start to be able to really talk things out well and manage their aggression in a, in a better way. These younger boys, I'd love to see them on the sport field or somewhere where they can get that aggression out rather than just, you know, kind of telling them they just have to hold it in because right. things held in too long start to explode. What you're trying to talk about is finding healthy ways to manage right. the, these boys' aggression and testosterone and how to handle that in a healthy way. Yeah. And I, I wanted to add too, I think boys need some kind of responsibility, some kind of tasks where they can feel competent and successful and have have positive experiences with taking responsibility you know just sitting and maybe playing a video game you know that again i I don't i think mental stimulation is good it's just that it's so such a small part of what they need they need more responsibility they need some kind of success experience and helping them accomplish things but they need parents to be aware of their of what boys need well i think that ties in if you're letting your your boy you know play video games eight nine hours a day sometimes we're not saying video games are the reason why boys are shooting but in moderation (laughs) in especially with covid i think it's been even worse because kids haven't been able to interact they haven't things are closed or work closed the parents are saying i gotta get work done just you know here's your devices because they don't know what else to do and it's just understanding the damage sure he can play those games he might even be fine playing a few kind of violent games for a little while but then where's that exercise where's that physical activity where's that as you said i liked what you said a second ago accomplishment something that he's accomplished and he feels confident and yeah. you know you don't hear about any of these shooters their their sports experience that none of them played instruments like you don't hear maybe they did and they're not they were not recording it but i doubt i highly doubt that these guys are doing these shootings and they also were you know, an accomplished pianist or something like they're not, they're not doing, (laughs) they're not doing things that are, that they're proud of that are healthy. Yeah. People have different interests. It could be, it could be more arts and music, but it might be physical activity. It may be helping build something or working on a farm, helping, helping mow the yard. So I think boys really need some responsibility to help them feel like they've, they're, they're, they're valid. <laughs> valid. Well, even, even riding a bike. I, I know in, in the area yeah. where I live, my son learned to ride a bike when he was eight. And most of his mm-hmm. friends were around there. I think some girls maybe a little earlier than that, but eight is, mm-hmm. I thought was, I was worried that he hadn't ridden a bike yet. But and then I found out it was kind of common. And I think when you guys were kids, and I'm talking about a two wheel bike, I'm not talking about a tricycle, a two wheeled bike, five, 
Wasn't that kind of more normal? Five, four? Yeah, I was riding bikes really young and I would go down the sidewalk. I was probably five or six. I And yeah. I loved doing that. And I remember the people saying, oh, look at that. He could, He's riding on the side of his, on two wheels. So it made it feel more yeah. confident. But, but boys I, I are, love- are not doing that as early, I think. I'm sure there's exceptions, but boys in general are, those things are coming later because they're not spending as much time outside. They're spending more time on their tablets. They're spending more time on video games and whatever it is. And, and they, they're not getting right. that outside stimulation that time. And, and it's tough. Right. It's hard. Well, and there's more, there's also more family breakups, more family trauma for them to have to try and deal with when they don't generally have as good verbal skills. Right. Now, what do you think when we go to the bullying, because I know bullying is one of the biggest things with the, all of the shooters, they were all bullied, horribly bullied. I remember reading one High percentage. Yeah. Just right. awful. One of the, the shooters, I think it was Columbine, the, the one of the kids who had feces thrown on him at school and he had to go through no. the whole day like just terrible i'm talking about terrible bullying and as you mentioned earlier girls bully as well but it's with boys it's a little bit more physical what do you think is going on in these these young men's mind when they're being bullied every day what's happening inside i think that they feel victimized okay and, th- and that's a horrible place to be when you feel victimized you start getting resentful and angry and the question is what do you what do you do about it yeah and so you want you want to get back at somebody. Sometimes these kids just, in, in a way, it's almost like they're going to take it out on anybody, society. They're just going to they're going to make it right. And then they, they also get a certain sense of, hey, I'm not a, I'm not being ignored. I'm not being a nobody. I'm not being invalidated, or yeah. I'm not invisible. I, I'm I made a difference. You know. But on, in some of our research about bullies, because I thought, okay, who are the bullies? Yeah. What creates bullies? And it said that a common reason a kid is a bully is because they lack attention from a parent at home and they lash out at others for attention. And this can include kids who are neglected, children of divorced parents, children whose parents are under the regular use of drugs and alcohol. So that helps to create bullies who then bully other kids. And it's just a vicious cycle. Well, it says that it says that kids who bully uh, generally learn this behavior at home. And that that kind of got me. I thought, what? Really? Yeah. Then they often become bullies so that they themselves are not victimized anymore by whoever's bullying right. them right. at home. I think understanding this about the bullying is a really, really big point. Um, I didn't realize that it was that big of a piece of what's going on with these young boys. What do you think? Why do you think some of these kids, because I mean, I know boys that have been bullied. I'm sure, you know, you said you were bullied. My husband was bullied when he was in school. Why do you think some men are, or young men are acting out with violence versus others? What's the co- What's the difference? I mean, that's a that's a good question because, mm-hmm. and, and I don't know that I know the answer for sure, but I know that two year olds are actually probably the most violent children. That's the violent age, okay? Two year old, two, two year olds. Usually by age four or five, they've been that's been socialized out. But there's always going to be a small group of those kids who want to dominate or still are going to hit, kick, and they're going to carry on. And they're going to carry that into aggressive activity and outbursts as they get older. And I think some of the most aggressive of these types, the ones that commit these violent acts, I, I think there may be a bit of a, a biological or a genetic uh, element here. Now, Why more now than then? Well, again, I don't think it's, they're not socialized out of it. It's like they just kind of grew up on their own. They're little survivors in a sense yeah. that they don't really have anybody they could trust or count on. And they think, okay, it's up to me. I got to, I got to take care of this. And, you know, and they don't really have the influences that they need. I mean, obviously okay. sometimes they get on YouTube or they get somewhere and they, they have this thing. They've, they've thought about it and they planned it out and they, they, they give their manifesto. you know, manifestos of, why they did it and how they're going to show yeah. everybody and get their revenge. And they probably worked on it and thought about it for some time before they actually do it. But girls don't act with violence and they're bullied and they can be depressed too. So why are girls not being bullied and acting out with violence? I, there's enough, possibly a number of reasons, but I think women are more relationship oriented. So there, there's a better chance that they're going to get socialized or have because uh, they seek it. They're going to seek they out seek relationships. Yeah. Now they may be mean or verbally aggressive, but they're going to do it more in a verbal way. And uh, they're, they're going to more maybe talk behind somebody's back or uh, maybe even just be mean to the, to the person and exclude them or uh, somehow trash talk. trash talk them. Yeah. There's a lot of trash talking. So what are some, what's some other advice that you might have for parents right now? Like I have a young boy and this is all really helpful for me, but what do you think some of the people out there that might be 
wanting to support their young boys more, and, and this is a concern for them, what is some other advice that you have for those parents? Well, you know, it's so easy to just tell a kid to go off and get on his tablet or his computer. And just be quiet. I would say spend some time, if, you, if, it, if at all possible, spend time, because I believe that boys especially, but girls as well, but boys especially need a role model or somebody who sets an example for them of how to be a man and how to treat other people and how to treat people who are weaker than you, and how to help treat them feel successful, and help them feel successful at it and help them feel like this is noble or heroic kind of behavior that they can engage in as a way of being successful and being competent in life. And I think they're more likely to see themselves in that way as, hey, I'm a, I'm a builder. I'm, I'm somebody who's going to help and make things better rather than, you know, I'm a victim I think I'm going to get revenge on the world. I'd, I'd rather, much rather see these kids think of themselves having a positive goal in their life, of, of becoming a, a... Wanting to do something as an adult, yeah. like a goal set. I want to do this when I grow up, and I want to do that. Kids often would do that, and healthier kids still do. They say, when I grow up, I want to be a fireman, or I want to... I want to be a teacher or whatever it is they want to do, and they, they kind of goal set for it. Right, and I want to encourage that because sometimes as parents, I've, I've seen this... Uh, sometimes where a parent, I hate to say this, but often mothers love having babies and they like that baby to stay a baby. <laughs> they don't want it to, I mean, they almost hate the fact that it starts to grow up. I've seen siblings get upset. Uh, one little girl I saw, she didn't like the fact that her little brother was growing up. She wanted him to stay a baby because she liked babies and she didn't like that change. And mm -hmm. so in a way, times we can inadvertently try to keep people from growing up. I, I want to encourage my kids. I want to, and I think I've tried to do that. I've tried to say, you know, you can do this. I, I, I love the way you do that. I tried to find things that they do well and encourage them in it. When you've talked to troubled little boys, which I know you've talked to many of them, what do they tend to say about their actions? Well, sometimes I've had little kids say, look, my parents don't care. Why should I? I hate that. And yeah. I, you know, I think I'll say to them, you know, your parents have problems and they're struggling with things, but you can make choices that are good for your life. Whether they support you or not, you can still do some good things. And what would you like to do? And I try to encourage them to get thinking about what are they, what would they like to accomplish? And the, I think uh, boys especially love that feeling of competence and being able to be successful at things. I often tell young boys when we talk, I say to them that, you know, the key for your life is developing skills. Now they'll say, well, I really like electronics or I really like mechanics or I really like sports or music, or whatever. I say, great, develop your skill in that because when you develop skills, you're going to have somebody want to pay you for it. And yeah. if you start to make a living from your skills, that's a good thing. And then also I say to the boys, I say, you know, girls like guys with skills and who can do things and can make some money and yeah. things just start to work based around boys developing their skills in whatever their interests are. I think resolving conflict is forever going, it feels like, with boys. It starts, like you said, just toddlers, resolving conflict, especially with other boys. That, mm -hmm. I feel like that's really important to talk to your kids about. And it's going to be different for everybody. But if, you're, if you are not talking to your kid about how to resolve, and resolve conflict with another boy, they're just going to grow up not knowing how. They're not going to know what to do. And, and instead of right. having a strategy, they're just going to be upset or they're going to bottle it. Right, right. Well, and they need to see good, good managing of that with their father and their mother. Well, yeah, it, it right. probably begins with the example you set for them because if, if mom and dad are able to resolve. resolve and address conflict and find a way to work together, there's a better chance that the kids are going to watch that. Also, it's not just parents. Sometimes without anything you can do about it, you're in a single parent family. It's how you resolve conflict with friends, with relatives. It, right. It's how you resolve conflict with coworkers. It, I know there's only so much that they're probably capable of when they're younger, but as they get older, teaching them how to resolve conflict, I think is so important. Sometimes it's even about teaching them that they need to resolve the conflict and figure it out. I think that's important right. too. You, right. Instead of you fixing it for them. Not just relying on you to fix it. You right. know, how can you help them learn how they can do it? Well, know? and the, this is a day, this, the era of the helicopter parents and the snowflake kids. And like, you don't want your kids to, you know, you step in and, and you're the helicopter parent and you're going to take over. And I think 
there, that can be damaging for that kid. You have to realize that they're not really learning anything. If you are stepping in, especially with boys, I think with girls, it can be a little easier for them to hug and say, sorry. And they kind of like forgive each other. Right. It's a little different right. with boys and conflict is always going to be there. I like what you said. You're always going to meet someone mean. There's no such thing as protecting your kids forever from mean people. You can't, you have to right. teach them how to resolve conflict. And those boys that were being bullied at school, and then they ended up being really violent later. I mean, those teachers could have been teaching them proper conflict resolution. Their parents could have been teaching them that not saying to, to blame everybody, but the kid, of course, the kids are to blame as well, but these are all things that we can do as well. Parents. I find, I find schools nowadays more often trying to get boys to resolve conflict, like the way girls naturally do rather than the way boys do. And they're trying to fit them into that mold because it's more, <clears throat> it's more polite. I don't know. It's less, mm -hmm. less physical perhaps, but there's got to be a way to encourage boys to resolve conflict where it's better for boys instead of trying to shove them into that like say you're sorry thing that girls girls naturally gravitate towards that anyway right and boys might say sorry but they're thinking inside <laughs> i'm mad i'm gonna take you out <laughs> <laughs> Later. Well, sorry, I didn't really do a whole lot. Not that we're saying right. you should resolve conflict with physical violence. I think there's good reasons why schools are putting some of those things into the place because they want the school to be safer. I get that. But I think I like what dad said about sports because you can learn to resolve conflict in sports in a very, very healthy way. I think this has been a really good conversation. I think we could go on and on. And I think one of the things that's the most infuriating, I don't know about you, when I'm watching people talk about this topic is more laws and more things. And we don't want to get into all the political part of this because that's not the, the message. But I think it's infuriating to hear that people think that the answers are kind of band-aids. And these are deeper rooted issues that are that can actually result in change, stronger families, stronger parenting, all these things we've talked about today, I think so valuable in the, in this day and age with all these shooting, it's terrible, terrifying to have a kid go to public school right now. I'm sure that everybody watching that's in the same boat as me, we know it's very, very scary. And these are the things that some of the things that we can do. The only way to fix this is for people to strengthen our, our culture, our homes, our relationships. Our relationships. And we're not going to do it with a bunch more laws because even if they, even if they said, let's take away every weapon imaginable, people will start making pipe bombs. I mean, there's, you cannot stop it from a law point of view. Well, you and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of talk out there that the answer is that if a kid is showing these red flags, call a hotline, get them help. I think that's great. But wouldn't it be great if we could actually prevent that step to even come? Like, for, we need to go 10 steps backwards from that. That's like oh. to the point where you're putting a Band-Aid on it. There. Yeah, that's, that's, that's there. Why aren't we talking about that? Why are we only talking about, well, that school should have stopped that. I've, I've heard that so many times or those people should have stopped him. He was showing signs. Well, that's great. That's great. But there's so many other things that can be done besides that. I, he's, showing, he's showing signs at home too. And, and that the school has so many children that they have to watch out for where, where parents see them. They live with them, at least when they're not at school. And they would see a lot more of those signs. Okay. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. This has been a very, very valuable topic. And thank you everyone out there for watching. If you have any other questions, comments about what you think is going on, we would love to hear from you. We try to read every single comment. Drop that down below. We're also attaching all of the links that you can find us on social media. And the books and workbooks that we sell are all attached to this video. Check those out when you have a second. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe so our channel will grow and we're here every weekend so check back with us next time and we hope to see you then bye bye bye, bye, -bye.